Hello, I'm Professor Dave DeRoche from the Near East South Asia Center for Strategic Studies in Washington, D.C., speaking to you today from my home in Bethesda, Maryland. And I want to talk to you today about missile defense. Missile defense is one of the key uh, facets of the modern security environment. Almost all countries in North Africa, the Near and Middle East, and South Asia face a missile def defense uh, threat to some nature. But a lot of people talk about missile defense, don't really understand the fundamentals. So hopefully today's exercise will, uh, will allow you to do that. There, if you'd like to follow up with any of these topics here, this is my social media. And uh, feel free to follow me on Twitter. I post uh, analyses and items of interest. Or uh, just write the NISA Center and I'll either address your question directly or if we get enough of the same questions, we'll do another uh, lecture. So first off, let me talk about what I'm not going to talk about. First off, I'm not going to talk about cruise missiles. This is a recent model Iranian cruise missile. Cruise missiles fly low to the ground and they, they breathe air like an airplane. They're basically conventional airplanes that are unmanned that fly at a low level. I'm also not going to talk about drones. This is also an Iranian drone similar to the Delta Wing drones used in the attack at the Abqaiq refinery uh, in Saudi Arabia. Um, Again, these are low-flying things. Normally when people talk about missile defense, what they're talking about are defense against ballistic missiles. This is a DESFOL ballistic missile. It's a modified uh, version of the Zulfagar missile that Iran has been producing for some years now. Uh, that in turn is based off of uh, SCUD designs that were reverse engineered from North Korea and originally the Soviet Union. Um, this is seen at a weapons fair in Iran. Um, another uh, missile that's commonly used here, this is uh, taken in uh, Yemen. This is what the Houthis in Yemen call the Burkan missile. It's actually a painted version of the Qiyam missile that is also produced uh, by uh, Iran and that we think is transported to Yemen. Uh, it's chopped in half, put in a shipping container, moved along with legitimate commerce or illegitimate commerce, and then welded uh, in in Yemen and then fired uh, at targets in Saudi Arabia. So first off, let's look at the nature of the threat and uh, the best indicator for this is the Iranian arsenal because uh, these are primarily based, as I said, off of the former Soviet Union SCUD designs plus a lot of additional engineering and the Iranians have made some pretty significant technological advancements in recent years taking advantage of the increases in miniaturization and in electronics in order to uh, improve their accuracy and their range. They've also uh, in recent years managed to uh, switch from liquid-fueled missiles to solid-fueled missiles. Uh, this allows them to move, it gives mobility to their missile arsenal. They're able to move them around. They don't have a uh, lag time between the decision to fire the missile where they have to fuel up the missile and then fire it. They can fire them almost instantly once the decision is made. As you can see, uh, the missiles here, this is produced by a think tank, uh, the missiles here show the missiles and then the color shows the range. So each of the missile has a range associated with it. And it can reach uh, most of the Middle East all the way into North Africa. So if these missiles are exported, you can just move the circles over and figure out what your threat ratio is. Uh, this is another uh, chart produced by a think tank here in Washington that shows the main elements of the Iranian missile arsenal. Uh, the workhorse of the Iranian missile is the Fatah 110. Relatively short range, but they've been producing this for years. Again, it's based almost directly off the SCUD model. And if you have enough of these fired at a target, uh, you, you will be able to defeat any conceivable missile defense system, any practical missile defense system. So the numbers are there. The second one of interest is the Zulfikar. Um, the Zulfikar seems to be the focus of recent Iranian efforts uh, for a sort of intermediate range missile that allows them to reach targets at a distance with higher accuracy. And then the Qiyam missile, which as I mentioned earlier, has been exported to the Houthis in Yemen and is used there to launch attacks deep into the interior of Saudi Arabia to include at Riyadh International Airport and the palace compound in Riyadh, although uh, so far there's no indication that any of these have actually uh, hit their target, rather they've been intercepted. Uh, this is me with the remnants of one of these Qiyam stroke Burkhan missiles. This is the missile that was fired at Riyadh International Airport in 2017. Uh, and this display was put together for members of the United Nations Security Council. Um, uh, at this you can see the, 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 weld, uh, whoops, the weld in the missile 
which shows uh, where it was cut in half and then reassembled, uh, and the quality of the weld is, is uh, quite noticeable. Um, also, the numbers on the missile there are, they correlate with valves that the uh, intelligence analysts used. Uh, they compared it with pictures from military parades in Iran and trade shows in order to correlate that this was in fact a Qiyam missile. It's, it's pretty uh, uh, easy to figure out. Uh, the Qiyam is kind of interesting in that it doesn't have fins, uh, which is unusual for uh, most missiles. Um, this is a warhead that's been fit to the Zulfikar and uh, earlier versions of the Zulfikar had sort of a baby bottle shape, but you can see this is a smooth conical shape and it has fins on the warhead. What that means is that it's, this is uh, easier to control, more aerodynamically static, once this warhead separates from the main body of the missile, it's more accurate. And indeed, the Iranians used this missile, uh, or one like it, to attack uh, an ISIS compound uh, in Syria in uh, 2018, the summer of 2018. You can see this is from the Iranian press, the before and after, uh, that they were able to attack a single building with a pretty good degree of accuracy. Now, the Iranians claim that they launched this missile from Iran. I personally think that it was launched by uh, uh, Iranian Revolutionary Guard units uh, and their uh, proxies, the Heshta Shevi, in Iraq. But either way, regardless of what the distance was, it was an impressive accomplishment to, to get that degree of accuracy. And this is of great concern to uh, every country that is a potential adversary of Iran because accuracy is really the key. Uh, to a missile efficacy. You're better off with a smaller missile, smaller warhead, but more accuracy than a larger missile with uh, lacking accuracy. So the increases that Iran has made is, is very important and uh, everybody's taking notice of it. So how does missile defense work? Well, this chart shows uh, the schematic for missile defense in the United States against Chinese and Soviet Union missiles in the 1960s. The theory uh, is pretty much uh, the same uh, from the 1960s, even though capabilities have increased. So first, you have to have one radar which, uh, whose purpose is basically to intercept the missiles, to track the missiles as they come in. Uh, as a general rule, uh, you have to have a network of radars for effective missile defense, some to acquire the targets at a relatively great range, and then they queue the actual uh, interception radars, which will guide the missiles onto the target. Um, the missiles launch, uh, you know, with their engine. They move up into orbit, or they move up into the sky in a parabolic arc, and then the uh, engines burn out and they descend in a predictable uh, parabola towards their target. So the uh, initial radar tracks that and then gives the guidance information to the intercept radar. Once it figures out the nature of that parabola, it only needs like two or three data points to project the parabola, then the interceptors are launched and the interceptors actually take it out. So you thought you didn't need geography or geometry uh, after junior high school, you actually do. Um, now of course, this parabolic uh, uh, angle from ballistic missiles kind of explains why most missile defense systems, conventional missile defense systems like the S-300, S-400, Patriot, and Thad are ineffective against low-flying maneuverable uh, targets such as cruise missiles and drones. Speaking of the S-400, this is the S-400 uh, as seen uh, in Russia. It has two radars, uh, so one is designed to uh, acquire the target at a distance. The second one is designed to basically steer in the missiles towards the incoming target. The missiles are stored in these canisters. <clears throat> the canisters are significant because that isolates the missile, uh, keeps it in a controlled environment. Uh, in the old days these missiles were just mounted on the back of trucks and they were subject to things like uh, rubber rings, gaskets would dry out, fuel would leak, control fluid would leak, the, the weather would have elements on it. But these canister missiles with solid motors in them means that the missile is basically maintenance free. Uh, it's not uh, affected by any of the problems uh, in the environment and so you get a higher degree of reliability than you would have gotten from uh, anti-missile missiles in the uh, 1970s and 1960s. This is Patriot and how it works. Again, the same theory. So you have a radar. Um, the radar has to be cued because the radar doesn't operate on 360 degrees. It has a a fan that it acquires things in, so you have to set the missile in a certain direction of the most likely threat. The radar gets the track, passes it to command center, which then directs uh, interceptors to be launched. 
the interceptor is launched and there are signals that guide the interceptor towards the target. Once the uh, Patriot gets closer, it's able to acquire the target on its own and hone in on the target. There are currently two versions of the Patriot missile that are uh, fielded. Uh, the Pac-2 Gems T is a uh, proximity warhead. That means that the missile gets close to the incoming target and then explodes. The warhead has uh, shrapnel that goes off and that disables the missile. And then the new Pac-3 is an intercept missile, so it actually has an inert warhead made out of cement. It flies up, will hit the target directly. Uh, obviously that wasn't possible uh, in previous years, but increases in computing power, communications, and miniaturization electronics have made it possible to hit a bullet with a bullet. Um, Patriot was originally uh, designed in 1969. Uh, and it was designed to shoot down airplanes. The idea that it would someday be used to actually direct a missile to hit an incoming missile I think was inconceivable in 1969. So it's a very adaptable system but it's subject to some limitations because as I said it was originally designed you know, for aircraft. Augmenting Patriot in the American arsenal is THAAD. THAAD has a uh, much improved radar which with the software uh, change can look hundreds of miles uh, away. But again, the principles are the same. So the radar tracks the incoming missile. It goes to the command center, which then directs the launch. And the launch uh, under control and then under its own control as it gets closer and closer goes and intercepts the incoming target. It's important to note that THAAD, uh, Patriot, operates from the ground up to a certain level. THAAD operates from a much higher level down to a lower level, not all the way to the ground. And so, um, basically, if you want to have comprehensive uh, point air defense of a specific target, you have to have both Patriot and THAAD together. With S-400, it claims to be effective all the way from the floor to its maximal operating altitude, although it's important to note S-400 has been fielded in Syria for some time, and it has not managed to stop uh, repeated Israeli and uh, American uh, incursions into supposedly protected space. Um, another schematic of Patriot and how it works shows again the importance of tracking and then once you get to a certain point on the track the, um, the missile takes over um, on its own accord and homes in on the target and thus intercepts it. Um, so the principles are the same from the 1960s but again this only applies to ballistic missiles. Now why is that the case? Well as you see with a ballistic missile that parabolic uh, line of flight that I spoke of, it's easily predictable. If you get a radar track here or here or here, you can determine, you can draw what that parabola is and determine not just where the missile is coming to, but also where it originated. So these radars uh, usually are linked in with uh, the Air Force of their country and as the missile defense asset is trying to intercept the missile, uh, ideally offensive assets other surface-to-surface -surface missiles or airplanes are being dispatched to take out the launch point and, and prevent a second round of launches. Uh, that's fine. The science uh, works that way. This has been practiced for years. But when you look at a cruise missile, it hugs the Earth. And it's much harder to intercept that. It's much harder to track it. Um, this shows uh, one of the latest model Iranian cruise missiles. Uh, the uh, attacks on the refinery at El Jerez was using uh, cruise missiles. Um, the Abkhaz attacks used drones, and part of the problem was it was just, um, first off, the uh, directional defenses were, I think, oriented towards the south, not towards the north in Saudi Arabia. But secondly, um, even if they had been oriented towards the north, it still would have been very difficult to detect such a low-flying target. Um, why is that the case? Well, it's because the Earth is curved. And, uh, you know, if you are at this point and you have a radar, and even if the radar is flush, if it's 90 degrees, the curvature of the Earth limits the ability of you to see a low-lying target. Um, so this is a Patriot radar. You see that it is angled, so the ability of it to acquire a target, uh, you know, the curvature of the Earth masks the target even more. Um, this is the curvature of the Earth. The red line shows the uh, line that the radar operates on. So the radar will see things uh, above this line to a certain height to a certain distance but it will not see anything below this line just because the earth is curved. Now you can defeat this by doing things like uh, putting a balloon up or putting uh, you know, radar assets in aircraft but 
that's uh, weather dependent, it's expensive, it's hard to do, although balloons are cheaper than uh, aircraft. And if you have a target like a drone that is able to keep low to the ground, you will not see that target until it's very, very close, probably too close for you to scramble appropriate assets to intercept it. So at 20 kilometers, which is not very far, um, basically the masking of the curve of the earth is 31 meters. So a target can be 31 meters off the ground or 30 meters off the ground at uh, 20 kilometers and you will not see it with a radar, uh, ground mounted radar just because of the curvature of the earth. So this is why ballistic missile defense focuses on ballistic missiles and again the technology was developed in the 1960s before drones and even cruise missiles were realistic threats, realistic weapons, and it's important to note that in recent years commercial developments in both drones and, and uh, uh, cruise missiles have really exceeded what uh, defense planners thought was possible. This capability is far greater than anybody thought was possible. Quite frankly, everybody's scrambling for a way to defeat this thing. So let's take a look at how air defense is analyzed and how it works. These circles, this was produced by a think tank and it shows air defenses of Iran. And what they did was they said, okay, what radars and what missiles does Iran have? And then where are they located? And then they said, okay, what are the maximum ranges of each of these? So for each of the assets, and a different color means a different kind of asset, a different kind of missile, different radar, they drew a circle at the maximum range. That's 360. Now, analysts know that some radars are 360. Missiles generally cannot fire effectively at 360. They have to be physically moved. They have a fan of opportunity. And most intercept radars, acquisition radars, tend to operate 360, but intercept radars operate on a fan. Um, but by the time a chart like this is drawn and makes its way to the public or to senior policymakers or national leaders, they tend to view the, um, these circles as entirely defended areas, as if there's a glass dome that was dropped in on them. And that's not the case. So uh, after the Abkhaz attacks, people said, oh my gosh, you know, these defenses uh, failed to uh, work. Well, they failed against, you know, a target that they weren't designed to defend against. Uh, it's kind of like condemning your toaster for not making a good cup of coffee. Um, uh, basically, these things are angled. So when you look at Iran here, I would argue that if you look at the actual effective uh, uh, area of air defense. It's not the 360 circle, it's a fan. You can argue over how wide it is, you can argue over how far out the fan goes, but it's a fan and that fan is generally oriented towards Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, Qatar, uh, the United Arab Emirates. Uh, an illustration of this with the Saudi example, this shows areas that are defended uh, by uh, air defense missiles in, in Saudi Arabia based on where they have been intercepted. And what you can see here is that the red area is areas that, quite frankly, if a missile is launched towards it, the Saudi authorities don't have the uh, resources to intercept it, or they choose not to just because it's unoccupied, it's desert, it's of low value, so they let the missile go. This, by the way, is an old technique. Uh, the British defense against the uh, V-2 bombs in World War II, uh, basically about 60% of those, once they were tracked, they realized that they would overfly important areas and they were just allowed to go on because they didn't have the ability to effectively intercept many V-2s. They wanted to focus on ones that they thought were going towards priority targets. The areas in yellow here are um, areas where there have been at least one intercept, and the areas in greens are where there have been more than one intercept. So what you can see is the actual defended areas are not these big circles that people like to draw with a protractor on a map. They're points, and modern missile defense really is a point defense thing. You can't defend everything. You can't defend an entire city. You can hope to defend specific facilities on bases. Um, and we saw a lot of this misunderstanding of the capability of missile defense in the uh, attacks by the Revolutionary Guard, the Iranian Revolutionary Guard, uh, on uh, Iraqi facilities that hosted American forces in the aftermath of the death of Qasem Soleimani. People said, well, why are these not defended? And the answer is, well, an air base is a pretty big area, and it's hard to defend it, and you have to have the assets in place. There were no missile defense assets in place uh, in Iraq at that time. So, showing the uh, Roughly the same information, but in a more uh, robust fashion, and I should give credit to the Center for Strategic and International Studies here in Washington, which produced these charts. Uh, the green shields here show roughly the radar range of each Patriot battery in the south of Saudi Arabia. This is not a comprehensive layout 
of all Patriot in Saudi Arabia. So there's a lot of Patriot in places like Dharan, for example, which is not shown here. Uh, but what you can see is that you don't have this big 360, you don't have a dome like an upside down goldfish bowl. What you have is a fan, and uh, most of the fans uh, are directional, it's about 60 degrees off the center of the radar, and those fans are oriented where the threat is. And so the threat for the most part is in Yemen. And you can see that down in Khamis Mushe, Abiyan, Jizan province, places like that, and in Riyadh. Um, so the threat is organized in that distance, and if the threat were to come from the other side, uh, chances are pretty good that these missiles would not be able to intercept it, because they just can't operate in 360, uh, in spite of what you see in the movies. Now, does it work? Well, I would argue it does, and again, this is from the Center for Strategic and International Studies. It's a, uh, a compilation based on newspaper reports and things of that nature of missile launches and missile intercepts. The green shows missiles that have been intercepted by the Saudis. The red shows missiles that have gotten through. That doesn't necessarily indicate a missile defense failure. What it indicates is that uh, the missile was not intercepted, so it could be on course for a low value area or an undefended area. But uh, what you can see is that the Saudi forces right now are the most uh, uh, effective army in the world at intercepting missiles. They've got over 160 missiles intercepted uh, with the Patriot system. Uh, no other country, the only country that comes close is the, uh, their partner in um, the war in Yemen, the United Arab Emirates. Uh, the United States Army doesn't has nowhere near this experience in intercepting missiles. And that is primarily because, not just because they've got good uh, equipment, but also because they've adapted their training and techniques. They've adapted some of their fielding. So, for example, uh, they have two launch operators on site and a Patriot battery, whereas the United States Army only calls for one. They've increased those requirements to minimize uh, the human interaction and human error. So with that in mind, uh, this wraps up my brief presentation today. I hope you found it useful. Again, if you have questions, uh, I urge you to contact me on social media. Uh, follow me for reports on missile defense, security, asymmetric warfare, and general political involvement. And uh, again, we welcome you to the NISA Center and look forward to engaging with you. Thank you.